Hi guys, Dr. Jillard here. Let's do our CVPP lecture for today. It's Thursday, week 5, fall 2021. I'm doing this from home. I have a bad cough, but if I do it this way, at least I can edit out the coughs. Today we're going to talk about the circle of Willis, and more importantly, we're going to talk about berry aneurysms, which occur in the circle of Willis. We'll also talk quickly about something called a arteriovenous anastomosis, which is rare, but it can be big trouble. Uh, all right, here we go. All right, un to understand berry aneurysms, we need to understand or review the anatomy of the circle of Willis. It's a circle of arteries that basically lives, well, we could say the base of the skull. It lives on top of the base of the skull, specifically in the middle cranial fossa. Now let's take a look at it. So here's an overhead view of the skull where we've taken off the skull cap or calvarium and we're looking down and we remember these. This right, we had this in gross 2 anatomy in second quarter. So this is the circle of Willis. Uh, it is said to be created by two major systems One's called the inter internal carotid artery system, and the other is called the vertebral basilar system. And we'll look at the how that all works in a minute. Uh, we can see the vertebral arteries here and here form the basilar artery. The basilar artery dead ends into the circle of Willis. And we'll go over the parts of it in a minute. Here's the internal carotid artery, which we studied in gross one and gross two, and the very end of it is a member of the circle of Willis uh, and it splits into a middle cerebral artery and we'll get into that in a minute. <clears throat> uh, where is it located? We already said it's in the middle cranial fossa. Specifically it's in a space called the subarachnoid space of the brain. Uh, anatomically you could say it surrounds the clivus, specifically the sphenoid portion of the clivus, the cella turcica and the optic chiasma. Let's take a look, another look at our skull here from an overhead view, bird's eye view, with the top of the skull removed. And we can see the sphenoid here. Um, here's the cella turcica. Here is the clivus. There's the occipital portion of the clivus. Here is the sphenoidal portion of the clivus. There's the dorsum cellae. I mean, this is the, uh, this is the pituitary sits right in here. And now, well, we should also go over this too. Um, so here's the anterior cranial fossa, the middle cranial fossa, and the posterior cranial fossa. This is more out of the plane of the page. This is into the plane of the page. This is deeper into the plane of the page. So it's in the middle cranial fossa, and here it is. Right. Let's look at the members here. You can read all about the members on that slide. But let's just go over them. So here's the basilar artery. Vertebral arteries were cut off, but you could, if we go back, we can see the vertebral arteries here. And we learned those in spinal anatomy. They, they come together, moving superiorly and anteriorly to form this basilar artery. That's what we have right here. There's the basilar artery. Basilar artery dead ends into the circle of Willis and splits. The basilar artery gives rise to these posterior cerebral arteries are here. So part of the posterior cerebral artery is a member of the circle of Willis. Now the posterior cer cerebral artery gives off a long skinny branch. It goes way up and connects with the terminal part of the internal carotid artery. That's called the posterior communicating artery. Clinically important. I actually took all the, um, the tumor or the the neurological sequelae, because you'll get that in neurology. So cutting down slides this quarter. So that's important. And notice it's a double-sided system. So the carotid artery is part of the circle of Willis, uh, but this internal carotid artery gives rise to another branch here right before it dead ends. Um, and this is the anterior cerebral artery right here in blue and it keeps going right on up, right? So the 
carotid, the internal carotid artery, which we followed through gross one and gross two, it actually dead ends. It's said to split into the middle cerebral artery and the anterior cerebral artery. And this posterior communicating is just a branch that, that dead ends into it. Um, so not all of the anterior cerebral artery is a member of the circle of Willis. Um, about halfway along its journey here, it gives off the anterior communicating artery. Note, there are two posterior communicating arteries and one anterior, uh, anterior communicating artery. This, this anterior cerebral artery and the anterior communicating artery and the other one, the other anterior communicating artery, that's called the anterior circulation. And that's where most aneurysms occur in this anterior circulation. Usually right here at the junction of the internal carotid and the anterior cerebral artery or the junction of the anterior communicating with the anterior cerebral artery. It likes these junctions right here. Weakness can occur there. Okay, just another picture. All right, now that we got our anatomy back up to speed, let's check out the berry aneurysm. So claim to fame, guaranteed on boards, guaranteed on my test. It's the most common type of cerebral artery or aneurysm, uh, period. Makes up 90% of all aneurysms of the brain. Okay, so any type of cerebral vascular type of aneurysm, if it's going to happen, it's going to be somewhere in the circle of Willis. And it's going to be a type called the Berry aneurysm. It's a special type. Um, it is always a saccular aneurysm, and we talked about how uh, a saccular aneurysm is a very focal outpouching, kind of looks like a berry coming off the main vessel, as opposed to a fusiformal aneurysm. And if it ruptures, because we've talked about how aneurysms in, are at increase for hemorrhage, for, for popping and rupturing, if it hemorrhages, it is one of the most, or it is the most frequent cause of a subarachnoid hemorrhage, which is not a good thing. In fact, only a third of, 33% of people can come out of a subarachnoid hemorrhage unscathed. 60, 33% die, and another 33% uh, are severely disabled by it. Uh, let's look at the subarachnoid space. You might be wondering, where is that subarachnoid space? Here's a cartoon. Here's the skull here. We have a layer of dura. Arachnoid, which is much thinner than this. Remember, there is a potential space between these layers called the subdural space that can fill. It's a potential bleed in here. We've all heard on TV. Oh, he's got a subdural hematoma. Well, that's where the blood is right there. Then we have a big cavity that's filled with cerebral spinal fluid flowing through here. And that's called the subarachnoid space. And those subarachnoid trabeculae, those weird little strands that come down. And there's one of the cerebral wheels. It's the middle cerebral uh, artery, or it can be anyone um, that lives in this space. It could be a part of the circle of Willis. It could be the, it looks almost like the, um, the end of the internal carotid artery. But who, I don't know. It could be any. It's just the, the point of it there. And then we have the brain itself, and the brain is covered with the pia mater. All right, so a subarachnoid hemorrhage means this cerebral vessel, as I think we said the middle cerebral vessel, it sprung a leak. It developed an aneurysm and bled. And you can see how the blood fills up the subarachnoid space and mixes in with the cerebral spinal fluid. And this will start to coagulate and get really thick, and you're going to have a trouble moving cerebral spinal fluid through here. And we'll look to see the sequelae of that. Here's another view. Remember the skull cap? We studied the, um, the dural folds here. Skull is weird because it has a, the dura splits here and forms another fold of dura that goes down and separates the cerebral hemispheres. Um, but we, the point of this is just to show you again the subarachnoid space is all this, all this space that's filled with a spider web. And ultimately the cerebrospinal fluid of course dumps into this 
the in this picture the superior sagittal sinus and it's basically taken back and returned uh, to the venous circulation and reprocessed all right so again berry aneurysms occur in the circle of willis or at least near the circle of willis usually at the junctions 30 million americans were diagnosed about 30 million americans come down with a symptomatic one of these per year four percent of the population has one of these most of them are asymptomatic and they don't know they have them what about the ideology these are considered congenital defects let me repeat that these are considered congenital defects uh, of the the arterial wall of the members of the circle of willis or wherever it occurs if it occurs near the circle of willis it's still called a berry aneurysm so there's something messed up uh, specifically the tunica media may not be present at all and the internal and external elastic laminae will be gone and if you don't have those you're going to be susceptible to just the pressure uh, of uh, an artery it has pressure it needs all those layers to withstand that pressure remember the the layers here I've showed this picture many times uh, but this is an artery and you can see there's the tunica intima here the first layer mostly in blue and arteries unlike veins have this extra layer of Swiss cheese that wraps around here well it's not really Swiss cheese but that's called the internal elastic lamin laminae and it's uh, pretty strong so it gives support and then tunica media is here and then there's the external elastic laminae we've talked about that a lot how dissecting aneurysms the blood rips out of here comes into here and splits the middle of the tunica media because it usually gets stopped by this external elastic laminae now imagine if this is gone this is gone and this is gone all you have is endothelium uh, and then the or all you have is the tunica intima and the tunica externa or the <clears throat> tunica adventitia are the only layers left the screen layers the tunica adventitia so tunica media is gone and the, these swiss cheese layers are gone so you can see it's quite easy to get an aneurysm there okay and the other risk factors apply. I mean, if you have Marfan syndrome, the connective tissue diseases, that would also increase the risk for these things. Um, I took these slides out, but the coarctation of the aorta, or did we talk about that? I think I talked about that briefly. Um, people with coarctation of the aorta are at high risk for berry aneurysm, so they should always be tested for that. About some fun facts about berry aneurysms. They are much more common then vertebral artery aneurysms or dissections. We said those are very rare. Actually, I took that out, I think, this quarter. I have that online. You should watch that before boards. Uh, they typically occur, as I said, in the anterior circulation, especially at the junctions of the members of the anterior circulation. And if you see one berry aneurysm, watch out. There's probably another one as well, about a 25% chance of being another one. Here's an old picture, but 40% of them occur right here in the anterior circulation, specifically at the junction of the anterior communicating artery um, and the anterior cerebral artery. And there's the end, there's the internal carotid artery right there, and you can see how it dead ends. It splits into this anterior, uh, anterior cer cer uh, cerebral artery and the middle cerebral artery here. 30% of them can occur at the first bifurcation of the middle cerebral artery, and then 20% occur at the bifurcation of the posterior communicating artery with the internal carotid artery. 4% down here at this kind of the junction of the basilar artery with the two posterior communicating arteries. What are the chances of hemorrhage? Well, after you get diagnosed from uh, of, of having one of these, there's about a 1.3% chance for the ones under 10 millimeters in size that it'll herniate per year. Um, if the aneurysm, the berry aneurysm, is bigger than 10 millimeters, that's not good. That's a 50% chance of hemorrhage. Uh, so very dangerous situation. 
What happens if it hemorrhages? What is the sequelae? The sequelae, or what is the result of the hemorrhage? Well, just like any hemorrhaging aneurysm, all the downstream tissue will become cheated out of blood and oxygen and glucose and food, so it'll die. So anything downstream dies, and it it depends how much the how much it's hemorrhaging. If it's blasting blood out into subarachnoid space, that tissue is going to become ischemic quickly and die. If just a little bit is leaking, you'll start to have maybe a TIA, like a pre-stroke condition. If it's blasting blood into the subarachnoid space, you're going to end up with a stroke most likely. About a 66% chance. Um, you can have motor damage depending where it occurs memory problems, autonomic nervous system problems. And um, yeah, when that brain tissue dies, that's called a stroke. It's like a heart attack of the brain. Here's the sequelae of a, a ruptured berry aneurysm. And it, I call it the weird rule of thirds, or weird rule of 33% because it's quite strange. So, um, well, it's... Well, let's talk about, no, let's go to right to the weird rule of thirds. So if you pop a berry aneurysm and you bleed, 33% die immediately. A massive sub, subarachnoid hemorrhage occurs, and we'll look at how that kind of compounds the problem. 33% become unconscious, which is a bad sign. They're going to have a stroke and be left uh, left with all sorts of permanent disability and maybe some people would wish they wouldn't have lived. It can be so horrible. 33%, so the 33% that become unconscious, really bad sign. 33% also stay conscious, and they actually do fairly well, although they are at risk for another bleed. So that's the weird kind of rule of thirds. What's What increases the chances of it popping and hemorrhaging? Um, so anything that increases the interthecal pressure, um, like Valsalva's test. You guys know what Valsalva's test is by now, but uh, here's a great Valsalva's test. You can see her face is so red, her jugular veins are popping out. Uh, tremendous. She's holding her breath, which she shouldn't be doing. Um, that's a Valsalva's test. But anything similar to that, it pressurizes the pipes. And if you have a weak pipe, it's it, has a chance of breaking during some type of Valsalva's event, uh, like lifting weights, uh, like being constipated and straining on the, the toilet with all your might, um, severe coughing attacks, people with COPD, um, weightlifting could go under sporting events, um, having an orgasm, um, that could do the trick as well. Anything like that. We looked at the weird rule of thirds. What are the signs and symptoms? I guarantee you I'm going to ask you this on my test. you got to know this. What's the sign and symptoms of a bleed? So number one, excruciating 10, 10, 10 out of a 10 scale, pain scale, VAS scale, 10, 10, excruciating headache. You're going to the ER. You wish you were in the ER. Migraine patients can act just like this. My, my, my wife... Um, we're both in our 60s. Uh, my wife had her first migraine maybe about five or six years ago. Never had one before. And I was scared to death. I thought she's having a stroke. Horrible, horrible, 10-10 headache. Take me to the ER. She's tough as nails. She never says anything like that. Um, she was vomiting. She's nauseated. Okay, Migraine can mimic that. Um, she did not have a seizure. Uh, if he, seizures are... If she would have had a seizure, I would have been terrified. But seizures are related to a bleed. Not just a berry aneurysm, but any type of bleed of the brain where the blood can rush into the subarachnoid space. Double vision. Photophobia. Migraine can do that. My wife had that one. She didn't have double vision, though, or blurred vision. And then she was fine when I tested all her neurological. I did a quick neurological exam. She was fine. So that gave me some relief. Uh, people who are having a stroke or having a bleed, they may have all kinds of paresthesia in their arms, 
tongue problems, face problems, it all depends what part of the brain has died. Migraine patients certainly don't have that. Then here's the problem. So it's bad enough that you have a burst pipe and the tissue downstream is getting cheated out of blood. But there's a weird phenomenon that occurs in the subarachnoid space. So if this, I didn't get my drawing tools, did I? No, I forgot to get them out. But if this pops and is leaking blood, blood's going to surround this artery. It's going to hit this artery as well. And you might think, well, so what? A little blood on the outside. Turns out that tunica adventitia hates to be touched by blood. And blood will cause a reflex spasm and completely shut this vessel off. So there's another stroke. you got more ischemia wherever the blood is going to that vessel. Same over here. Maybe it won't shut it all the way off. Maybe it will. But it will significantly uh, compress it. What's the mechanism of that? Uh, they found that the stimulation of blood releases endothelin. And we said that's a powerful vasoconstrictor. Um, and inflammation can occur as well afterwards. Arachnidonic acid is uh, released, which can make a big scar tissue mess of this, as we'll see a little later. Um, yeah, so that just, as I said already, it just worsens the stroke. All right. So the other problem, I guess we're going to go to it right now. So after the stroke is over, after the hemorrhage is over, if you came out of, if you're one of those third that is still alive, that blood has to do something, and it scars. It turns into a massive, massive scar tissue, like this cartoon here. So can you imagine trying to get cerebrospinal fluid through here? Well, it's a beaver dam, right? We're back to the beaver dam concept. So the blood's going to back up down here, and the pressure's going to get greater and greater. The blood's going to be decreased in this region, uh, but the pressure can build up so much that it actually expands the skull. Let me say that again. It blows up the skull and the skull will get bigger and bigger and bigger. So not not a good thing. So yep, that's called fibrosis. This is fibrosis. It's just scar tissue. May calcify, may not, but just the, the collagen, the type 1 collagen that's laid down in here is, might as well be bone. Right, here's a poor little guy who has already had one surgery to try to relieve the hydrocephalus. Um, but little kids are particularly susceptible because their growth plates of the sutures of the skull haven't fused. And so the skull can be pushed apart real easy, which in a way is a good thing because it, it can give a little, the brain won't be quite as compressed. In an adult, the skull's, it's harder for the skull to move uh, in fact, sometimes it's impossible. It just, it just, it's almost like a cardiac tamponade of the brain. But yeah, um, surprisingly, at least a little hydrocephalus occurs in about a quarter of people who have a subarachnoid hemorrhage for any type of problem. All right, let's get into this AV fistula. Let's see what that's all about. So AV fistula is... Well, we know what a fistula is. It's an abnormal communication between an artery and a vein. And it's not supposed to be there. You're not supposed to... Remember, normally we have a capillary system that dissipates that very high uh, orthostatic pressure that is propagated through the, the blood vessels, through the arteries. So... If you connect an artery to a vein without dissipating or reducing that high hydrostatic pressure, did I say orthostatic? Hydrostatic pressure should be. Um, you're in trouble. The vein's not designed to handle that much pressure, and it's not designed to handle that much blood flow. And it's going to stretch the vein out like crazy, and it's going to bomb the lungs with extra blood that it shouldn't be. As well. I got ahead of my slides, but that's basically... Uh, what the story is here. So this is one in the brain. I don't know if we should have put that in here yet. Okay, um, so AV anastomoses, did I say that here? AV anastomoses are not the same as this AV fistula we're talking about here. 
These AV shunts or AV anastomoses are normal. They're placed normally upstream from capillary beds. Normally they're closed, uh, but ep epinephrine and um, I think angiotensin II can bind to this as well. This tube can be opened and closed. If we're if we don't need if this capillary bed doesn't need servicing, you can actually open this up, and the blood will shunt right across into the venous system here. You can also close this. Uh, this is a meta arterio. You can close this tube and close all these tubes off. But it's just a way to, not to waste blood. You don't need to if the tissue doesn't need servicing. Servicing means if it doesn't need blood flow, it doesn't need oxygen and glucose, nitrogen and such. There's no sense of, of wasting blood, so you might as well dump the blood right back into the arterial side. We've talked about that in um, hypovolemic shock, how important that mechanism. Anyway, I'm not going to repeat that a lecture, but it's not the same. It's a different thing. AV shunts are normal. AV anastomoses are not, or sorry, AV fistulas are not normal. And um, yeah, it causes blood to, if you get a shunting of blood where you're not supposed to, just imagine this was the AV fistula. I'll show you a picture of one in a minute. <clears throat> Normally the vessels would be touching, but if blood is being routed through here, this tissue, and it needs servicing, you can't get much blood into it. So it, it hypoxia occurs of the tissue, and it can kill the tissue if the, the fistula is big enough. Plus, as I said, it overloads the venous return, and that's going to flood the heart. The heart doesn't care about it, but the lungs will. You have to pass all that extra blood into the microcirculation of the lungs, and it starts to damage the capillaries, the microcirculation around the capillaries, and cause scar tissue. It makes it hard to push blood through that capillary system, and that's what pulmonary hypertension is all about. So they can cause pulmonary hypertension. Here's a, another scenario. Here's a normal AV anastomosis or an AV shunt here. We don't see any fistula here. Normally, of course, the blood would go here, go into the the upstream, proximal part of the capillary, and go into the downstream part of the capillary. Hydrostatic pressure would be greatly decreased across this capillary system. And then it's dumped into the venule, and there it goes, and there's a valve. Okay, now let's introduce a AV fistula. So now we have an abnormal communication. Maybe this patient got a, uh, an, inf an infection in the tissue over here, or maybe they got septicemia and got bugs, and the bugs grew in a wicked inflammation, burled a hole between a close artery and a vein. And we know that. I mean, some of those medium-sized arteries... Uh, they usually have two satellite veins on each side, so you can see how this could happen really easy if you remember your anatomy. So here we have, we still have some blood going downstream, but this tissue is going to become ischemic down here. Um, but mo a lot of the blood is jumping over to the venous side, and it's, look at how big it is. It's stretched out uh, the venule, and that's not good. It could pop and cause a bleed, and then... And then how's this tissue going to, it's becoming ischemic. How are you going to fix that? Well, the heart, the left heart has to pump harder to force more blood in here, which makes this worse, but at least it'll get the proper amount of blood th flowing through here at the expense of the heart if this thing is, you know, a big one. So what causes an AV fistula? Uh, it's an inflammatory necrosis from any type of inflammation, whether it be an inflammation, uh, infection that we just talked about, a vasculitis, or maybe Berger's disease, an autoimmune attack. Could be a penetrating injury. Maybe you were stabbed with a knife and it, it ruptured an artery in a nearby vein and they healed together. And occasionally they're congenital, but that's not the norm. Uh, where, can, where do they occur? Anywhere. Side-by-side -side circulation occurs. They love to occur Remember the vessels in the forearms and the vessels in the legs because they have satellite veins that run. There's an artery in the middle and a right and left satellite vein. So you get an inflammation into that area and it can occur quite easily. Well, I shouldn't say easily because they're not that, they're not that common. Uh, the trouble is some of these 
A specific type of AV fistula occurs in the CNS, in the brain and spinal cords, and that's very dangerous. In fact, I had a, a few years ago, I had a patient's grandfather pass away from um, this CNS type of AV fistula. It's called the AVM, but we'll look at that in a second. Um, yeah, the sequelae of these fistulas, as I already said, downstream ischemia. Um, the left heart has to work harder to properly perfuse the tissue, so you eventually get a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The heart just can't work hard forever, can't lift weights every day, can you? You can't go into the gym and lift heavy weights every single day. You're going to wear out everything, your joints, your arms, hearts the same way. You wear out the muscle. It gets really big, but it gets muscle-bound and doesn't work and fails. And Cardiomyopathy means heart failure. Um, could be a rare cause of, of increased blood pressure in that scenario we just said. If the patient has, well, we, I just explained that. I don't have to explain that again. Um, yep. And sometimes if it's a tiny one, no big deal. It's not going to cause any trouble. It, the, the vein that gets hit with all this extra high-pressure blood is going to varicose. I'll show you a horrible picture here in a second because they're not designed. The veins are, they don't have those internal external elastic laminae. They're not designed to handle this pressure. Um, and, uh, yeah, it can even hemorrhage. Not good if it occurs inside the noodle. And the intracerebral uh, hemorrhage is very, very dangerous, as we saw. Um, so here's a common one right here in the vessels of the uh, forearm, maybe the medial, the greater, or the cephalic vein, and the ulnar artery here. And someone who got an inflammation, maybe they got stabbed, whatever happened, an inflammation occurred, and it got into both vessels, and it ended up burling a hole here. So just like our pitcher, we have arterial blood flying in here, and we're losing a lot of it here, which is varicosing this vein, injuring the lungs, top of that, and, and then the hand is going to be cheated out of blood. Um, this patient, we've talked about Allen's test. We, you guys know how to do that. This patient would have a policid of Allen's test here because they don't have much blood pressure, much blood flow here. Uh, but yeah, it can definitely wreck the lungs. Let's take a look. Kind of gross picture coming. Yeah, that's crazy, isn't it? I think this is uh, in India. And um, why they wait so long to go to the docks, I don't know. But his lungs are ruined. Um, so it's just it started out in this example right here, maybe a little bit higher up. And you can see the cephalic vein is crazy big overpressurized, way too much blood flowing through there. His lungs just are getting hit with huge quantities of blood, which caused fibrosis, the microcirculation. And then they couldn't get blood through the heart, through all that mess. So the right heart had to start pumping very, very hard to push through that, and they got right heart failure. Plus the left heart had to pump hard to get blood down to his hand and his forearm. So it ruined the right and the left side of the heart because of this. This is an extreme example. Normally people don't wait so long to go to doctors. At least they shouldn't because now his life is pretty much ruined. All right, let's look at AV malformation. So this is just one of the subtypes. It's the only subtype I'm going to talk about, but it's the most common type of AV fistula. And it is a spider web of fistulas. So they're between arteries and veins. And they might be between two arteries and two veins, an artery and a vein. It's just a tangled knot of these fistulas. And it causes really bad downstream ischemia. And uh, it's not good. It can eventually cause a stroke. Here's a really nice picture of one. Uh, and you can see it's just a tangle of arteries and veins that are welded together. You can see the blood coming in here two ways. It's going out here and look how varicose the venous, the venous system is uh, from this. So the heart is working harder to try to pump through here but your part of this brain is going to become ischemic and eventually one of these is going to pop 
and you're going to get uh, get yourself a subdural hematoma or a subdural or sorry a subarachnoid bleed and you're in, in great trouble then one of the, the one of the thirds will apply to you right so it's not good about 2% of all strokes come from this AVM this arterial venous malformation they can occur they could walk into your office rarely I've never seen one of these but they could walk into your office with bilateral sciatica um, here's an AVM that is crushing the back of the well in this case it wouldn't be sciatica but they could have all sorts of neurological problems positive or upper motor tract lesion signs like Babinski's Hoffman's um, could be Romberg's if it was up higher it all depends where it come where it occurs but the spinal cord is getting compressed by this thing Okay, some fun facts. Epidemiology of the AVM malformation. Prevalence is about 2%. Uh, Two-thirds of them are diagnosed before the age of 40. These are not as dangerous as the berry aneurysm, so that's a good thing. Uh, about 4% of these will hemorrhage. Uh, and if it hemorrhages, 33% of people don't die. Uh, the hemorrhage is not nearly as, as forceful. And not as much blood is lost. Um, but there's a 10% chance of mortality, so it's still significant. 30% chance of staying alive but having neurological sequelae. <clears throat> and 17% of having a stroke. That would that would I mean if you have a stroke, you're gonna have neurological neurological sequelae, so it's kind of a weird number. Uh, what about the symptoms? Again, these are they're completely asymptomatic, just like a berry aneurysm, until they hemorrhage, or if they start compressing adjacent blood vessels and pinch them off completely, then you'll have a stroke from that kind of beaver dam effect. Um, they're typically discovered accidentally on uh, MRI scan of maybe the cervical spine. You can see them. And about 12% uh, will experience ischemia and um, which would cause a new seizure so maybe someone has a seizure for a first time and it was because of ischemia and then local weakness paresis loss of coordination all neurological sequelae severe headache as well uh, memory difficulty hallucination speech difficulty etc right here's another example of one um, just the same cartoon. The blood's going this way, but a lot of the blood is going through this AVM here in the brain. So you have this capillary supply, and maybe this is Brokaw's speech center, so your or your speech area. So you can't all of a sudden you have trouble talking because this speech area is getting starting to die. The heart will try to compensate for that, but all the blood dumping into this vein here, the vein is greatly enlarged because of this. All right, that will do it. I didn't squeeze any more material uh, because we do have our test next week in CVPP, right? It's week six. So email me those questions and see y'all later.